I sometimes feel like someday soon we will like disappear from the face of the earth. Sometimes I feel sad. Most of the times I feel scared. Because <laughs> we'll never know what happens. There was a book that I read about uh, sea level rise and it uh, told me that uh, small islands are not seeking it. They are shrinking by uh, coastal erosion. So maybe that's my thought about uh, what my elders told me. But the islands were, are not sinking, they're just uh, shrinking. The time in the way I could not make the fin what they need, I could not make the fin what they I have lived on the island ever since I was three years old. Up until now, I've seen a lot of changes in the weather, in terms of strong winds. The whole day can be a fine, clear day. Then all of a sudden, strong winds hit the island. Then you'll see people will start preparing their families. At other times, the Met Observer will inform us that something is about to happen. But when we look at the sea, the sea looks calm, and we don't even see a single wave. There are also many other changes in the weather. Sometimes when it gets cold, it's really cold, and when it's hot, it gets really hot. <laughs> Growing up on the island, we did not think or understand what climate change was about. But now I can see the changes in weather patterns, and I have become more anxious when I think about it. I think about what will happen to my family, my children and my grandchildren. Will there be an evacuation place for us to run when disaster strikes? Situated east of Australia and north of Fiji is Tuvalu, one of the smallest and most remote countries in the world, with a total land area of 25.9 square kilometers and a population of less than 12,000 people. As a small island developing state and one of the most vulnerable countries in the world, Tuvalu is experiencing the impacts of climate change, with projected sea level rise, increase in the severity of cyclones and ocean temperatures, compounded by ocean acidification. The Tuvalu government understands the development challenges related to climate change and the urgency of implementing adaptation methods. Therefore, it has made a commitment that climate change efforts are undertaken at the national and community level. Out of this commitment, the National Adaptation Program of Action, or NAPA, as it is commonly referred to, was conceived. And we are very appreciative of the, uh, the launching or rather the installation of that particular activity under NAPA 2. And uh, of course uh, it is to help people adapt to the impacts of climate change, sea level rise, which are already felt uh, uh, severely by the people of Tuvalu. But if you consider Tuvalu like other small islands as isolated, fragmented and uh, with the big oceans in between the islands, communications is extremely, extremely important, is critical. I believe that this, um, this project is uh, special to UNDP, firstly because the way it was designed and the way it was implemented was really done um, not by um, you know coming in and doing it for people, but there was uh, tremendous consultations with people. There was a lot of analysis that was done in terms of what solutions would work and would be sustainable, and it, it really built that ownership uh, throughout. Uh, there was a project called the Napa Only National Adaptation Pro uh, Program of Actions in 2007, where all the the islands uh, leaders came together and. Uh, 
and uh, draw up a, a plan and also the, uh, the activities that they, they want to implement. Uh, and they came up with, uh, with seven uh, of the, the projects uh, that they want to, 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 to implement in, in Tuvalu. So number one, took care of the, of the coastal protection, the water security and the food security. Uh, and then number two came in and uh, took care of the, the marine-based uh, livelihoods, uh, the disaster preparedness, the strengthening of the island uh, uh, kaupules, uh, and also the integrating of uh, climate risks into island strategic plans. So that's where the, the number two came in and started uh, uh, to implement those activities uh, in Tuvalu. The second component on disaster risk preparedness focuses on improving the early warning systems for people on the outer islands by strengthening reliable communication systems. To carry out the installation of the system, specialized skills and technical expertise is required. Colin Schulz is a telecommunications engineer and a person highly regarded and respected in the Pacific region, having worked in a number of Pacific countries, as well as with the United States Weather Service. And there's one fuse for the light comes out, I think. Because of his vast experience and knowledge in telecommunications and meteorology, he was recruited as a project engineer and consultant for the Napa 2 project. When we looked at the needs in Tuvalu, we saw that communication was a very important part especially 24-hour urgent fully available communications for reaching the last kilometer, reaching the last island, reaching the last mile. For the islanders, having this improved communication system is not only a great improvement but also provides a sense of security especially in times of impending disaster. Personally, I want the whole island to have the same level of understanding on disaster awareness. It's also important for children to be aware. When a warning is sent to the island of an impending disaster, as a mother, I will start preparing the family and the children will also know what to do if they're not at the house or their parents are not there. However, my only request is that all visiting departments should spend more time raising awareness on the island so that the whole island will have the same level of understanding. Now that you have installed this equipment, it is very good for those of us who live some distance away because now we are able to receive warnings together with the whole island in a timely manner. Compared to the past, we usually receive the warning from the Kaupule's truck that comes and announces the impending disaster. Now with this early warning system, we are able to receive the warning as one, especially in times of disaster. Collaboration with other partners is a key factor, not only for the success of the project, but also for sustainability. That's why we we include major stakeholders such as uh, telecom, the, the METS, uh, meteorological uh, department, so that they, they, they're looking after the, the maintenance uh, of this uh, early warning system uh, equipment. And the other factor that I want to, 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 to mention is that we are so fortunate to have this boat, the RV Talamoana. Uh, because without this boat, we, we cannot uh, install our early warning system uh, equipment in all the islands because I think that uh, government boats only goes up to one to two hours on each island. But with a boat like the RV Talamona, we are able, we are able to finish our work because it can be there for three to four days so that we can install every equipment and then test it. Through the Napa 2 project, UNDP supported the Tuvalu government to purchase a vessel specifically for the purpose of transporting materials and equipment for the installation of the early warning system. In 2016, the RV Talamoana was purchased. For some of the activities, we really needed a sturdy um, um, ships that could really bring the materials. And that was a, a challenge in previous projects. And what was really special about this particular project is that we, we were able to, 
to build into the program a solution um, in the form of um, a, a sturdy boat uh, that could really serve the project and bring people and materials in a reliable, timely way. Uh, and I think that that was a very important lesson learned and one that I hope that we can um, build into other projects in the future. As state-of-the-art equipment is being installed, it is very important that the installation be done by people with a great deal of experience and technical expertise. Comtech, a Fiji-based company, was selected to carry out the installation under the direction of Managing Director Mick Cornish. Tuvalu is uh, a very uh, trying and difficult uh, place to install and commission, so we had to be very uh, thorough with our uh, equipment selection, purchasing and testing even before it, uh, we hit uh, Tuvalu and commence the project. Um, that took a lot of time and a lot of uh, arranging, but um, it's come together well. And as you've seen, it's all uh, labor intensive and as far as getting the infrastructure, civil works done. So that in itself is uh, quite a task. Um, and then the um, electronics and um, testing, a lot of what we had already uh, carried out in the factories and uh, retested in uh, Funafuti before we departed with the product uh, experts. And then the commissioning side is, uh, is dependent on uh, what, we, what we actually come up against on site. The observations that our med stations here make are extremely important, not just for Tuvalu, but for the rest of the world. And it's imperative that they get the, the readings to the networks, the international networks, on time so that analysis can be carried out. For the Tuvalu Meteorological Office, the installation of the new equipment on each of the islands would enable regular and more reliable communications with the Met Office in the capital, Funafuti. Until now, we sort of come up with a, a more reliable uh, technology that can communicate and sustain that between the Outer Island and the Met Office. So for this project, it sort of uh, come in two, in two ways. One is for the, um, for the delivery of the early warning system, and the other part is to have the on a daily basis the, the weather information and also can be used as part of uh, if there is communication issue on each island. When we started on the Tuvalu project we realized that a lot of the islands didn't have 24-hour contact. They didn't have a system of getting warnings in that was reliable. So I realized very quickly and together with our colleagues on the project that we needed a proper alarm system. And so that's what we've done. And it's interesting to note that Tuvalu is the first country that we're actually got a fully blown alarm system with sirens and things like that. Technology now, you can uh, sort of uh, do a lot of things to the of radio using the frequency, run it, a yeah? uh, radio internet. So now, like during daytime, that's the suitable frequency and we can relay uh, the message either through voice, uh, either through email or chat or by, uh, through attachment. It must be available to the community. So we wanted to put it somewhere where it was available 24 hours, that if there is a warning sent, then somebody can attend to it, see what the warning's all about and then contact somebody to say what's going on or what do we need to do. Okay, when there's a tsunami warning, then they can just access to that uh, Cherry Beetle or HF radio if all the uh, communications are down. The, the good thing about Cherry Beetle and uh, HF is that they are powered from solar. So still they are running if there's a uh, problem with electricity. So that's a good thing. With the Chatty Beetle installed, the Tuvalu Met Office now has an up-to-date state-of-the-art system that can communicate weather readings and weather information quickly and reliably. The Chatty Beetle uses text messages to communicate between the Outer Islands and Funafuti. The training is a very, very important part of the project. Uh, unless people know how to use it, how to use it effectively, how to use it 
so that it's going to be sustainable, that it's a waste of time. And that's a very important part as you've seen, we have commenced our installations and a very big part of that is the training part of it. Uh, we have a technician from uh, telecom and a technician from the Met office um, accompanying us, uh, whom we do hands-on training because they're supposed to come with some uh, level of expertise or experience too. And uh, apart from that, we've, uh, we have to train the operators. That's been uh, a challenge because they come, at, uh, come to us at different levels of experience and expertise, so we just have to do a lot of hands-on repetitive training so they can get it right when most needed. Integral to this component of NAPA 2 was the issuing of solar-powered radios to each household as another adaptation method. For the islanders, this was a great relief, as they no longer needed to rely on batteries or electricity to power their radios. It was very clear to us that the broadcasting service here from the National Broadcasting Station is a very important part of getting messages out, getting educational material, getting awareness out to the outer islands. But we also found that a lot of places didn't have decent radio receivers. And so one of the very early initiatives was to put on our shopping list new radio receivers for each of the outer islands. And we decided that one radio per household would be a very good way of helping. I'm very thankful for the radio and the reason that we are receiving them. Radios are very important to a family and also other families on the island. Given that the radios also come with a light, so when the disaster strikes and the power goes off, there's some help from the light of the radio. Plus the announcements on radio and especially weather forecasts. I'm very thankful that the whole island has received radios. Throughout the course of the installation of the early warning system, the Napa 2 project teamed up with the Disaster Coordination Unit, the Met Office and the Tuvalu Red Cross to conduct Vulnerability and Capacity Assessment, VCA, in order to develop disaster plans for each island. Because we work with communities and we have developed uh, disaster plans for these communities before, which is why Napa 2 invited us to be part of the the team that was developing the island disaster plans one step higher and we were quite happy to be part to be invited to be part of the part of the team because usually Tuvalu Red Cross tends to focus more on individual communities and now we have the opportunity to work with the island communities as a whole there was also training on disaster risk preparedness to create greater awareness on issues around climate change and weather-related subjects such as wind speeds and what to look out for during cyclone warning announcements over the radio. I have become aware of the term climate change just recently. I would say a couple of years back, say five years ago, when I first learned about climate change. But before we see all these changes in weather patterns, we did not know that it was climate change. Just recently, when the government started advocating on climate change and its impacts at Tuvalu, that's when I understood what climate change and its impacts was about. Due to your arrival on the island, we have become aware of the reason of your visit. I am very thankful for the machines that have been installed, as it will assist the island in times of disaster. Before the Napa team arrived on the island, we relied solely on Radio Tuvalu to receive warnings. However, we now have other timely means of receiving warnings. I am very thankful as a Vaitupu Islander for the assistance received from Napa 2 because if it wasn't for donors funding this project, the island would not have received this type of assistance.
The National Adaptation Program of Action, NAPA2, is an important and integral plan for the long-term sustainability of climate change adaptation in Tuvalu. Advocating the cause by raising awareness internationally is vital, as the rest of the world needs to be aware of the impacts of climate change on this very small island state. So NAPA2 is a big, uh, important component. It is an important step towards an overall uh, long-term adaptation program for Tuvalu. The less we mitigate, the more we have to adapt. The more we uh, try to reach the target of 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, by, <clears throat> uh, by mid-century, the less we have to adapt. And therefore, ultimately, the, uh, we avoid having to leave our, our islands and relocate ourselves. And that's certainly my, my strong hope that we can continue to work together. There is now a great deal of awareness of climate change in Tuvalu. And while the country and her people are adapting to the changes, their traditional culture and way of living continue. While the future may appear bleak and uncertain, there is still hope. People continue with their lives and engage in their cultural traditions. And above all, there is their religious belief and unbending faith. And that is what gives them hope. I personally think there's a need for more preparations to the future. Currently on the island, there's a housing scheme in which houses are elevated. This is assistance to families so that kids have a better place to live in due to the impacts, hence the construction of houses on two levels. We Tuvaluans prefer our own traditional huts as it's much cooler and nice. However, nowadays, due to the impacts, I now prefer this new housing scheme because of sea level rise and other impacts. Now I want this kind of house. But in the past, we always prefer the thatched roof huts. The way UNDP works is not uh, that we come in and uh, as engineers and just do the work. It's, it's about um, uh, ensuring that people are involved, that they are empowered, that they have an opportunity to learn and to, to uh, be able to operate the, the, the equipment, uh, learn how to maintain it. And so in that sense, there are many additional um, added value to, to this initiative. We are happy with NAPA2 and we want to thank uh, our partners um, UNDP in particular, Global Environment Facility. But in all these efforts, we are still concerned of the impacts of climate change and sea level rise, and particularly on uh, unfortunate situation where uh, people, communities will be displaced. <laughs> Tuvaluans world should now react to carve our future so we don't have to abandon our small and beautiful island. To all Tuvaluans people, to all island people, that no matter what happens in the future, we just have to hope and try to change it because a lot can happen in these few years coming. We'll never know what happens, so try it. We don't have to give up hope, because if all hope is lost, then at least we have to be happy that at least we, do, we did our best. Yeah.